Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hey, Trump. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Jerry, Jerry's Dr. Camerata. Says connecting audio. Hmm. You may have to hit, if you can hear us, uh, if you can hear us, you may have to hit connect with internet audio. Let me give him a call. I don't know if his cell phone... Uh, I have a cell phone. Can you hear me, Tro? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Perfect. Okay, great. I'm just trying to get my, uh, uh, let me see here. Start video. Oh, that's on. You got it. Yeah. You're on, Doc. We don't, we don't record video, but I mean, we record the video, but it's a, obviously it's a podcast. So nice to see you. Nice to see you, buddy. Okay. Let's see if so, this is a good background. There we go. Oh, yeah, that's, that's perfect. Cool. Yeah, yeah. That's perfect. Okay. Love it. Love it. Love it. Where hey, are you, Doc? At, uh, you're, you're at work? Uh, of course. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I didn't know if the schools are open, not open. What's going on? No, with that? we're, we're, uh, we're not open for, uh, for students right now. Probably this semester is going to be virtual. Maybe toward the end of the semester, we'll bring in individuals to do their PD and OMM. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, wow, that must have been a crazy transition you guys are planning for. It's it's un, it's unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. I I just talked to uh, you know they 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 gave them the Middletown and the Harlem campus my info so I can have some students come here. They said they Wait. have nobody to rotate with, you know. So I was right. like, let them come here, you know. Sure. And and we even do it remotely. We literally do half of our visits are right through this. This you know? is great. Yeah. So um, now that everybody can build for telemedicine. Hello and welcome back to the Low Carb MD podcast. This is an important one. Tro, welcome, man. Good to see you again. I'm Brian mm -hmm. Lenskis, and I'm here with my faithful partner here, Tro Kalajian. <laughs> I'm, I'm, today is a very special day for me. There's been very uh, a couple of key people who've had a huge impact on my life, and the person we're interviewing today is somebody who's been. Uh, a huge mentor for me for many years, somebody who supported me, you know, uh, at 350 pounds as a medical student, uh, trying to figure out my way and all the way through to becoming an attending and, and uh, helping me get involved in the community, in the medical community, medical students, even to this day. Somebody I'm very happy to have here on the podcast and uh, talking about very important things, nonetheless, particularly about fatherhood and bonding. So I'm very happy to have Dr. Jerry Camerata here today. Uh, just a couple of things about him that you all should know. He's uh, the chief operating officer at Toro, uh, the medical school, and, and he served as deans both at the Middletown campus and the uh, Harlem campus, educated, helped to educate thousands of medical students bringing doctors to underserved communities uh, here in the, the Northeast area. 
Um, he's had a number of other roles uh, in the New York City uh, government and just somebody I'm proud and honored to know and somebody who's really supported me. So thank you. If that wasn't uh, enough of accolades, there's, I can talk for hours about everything, you know, the amount of people he's affected. So thank you for coming today, Jerry Camerata. My pleasure to be here. This is a great, great opportunity. And with all of those accolades that you bestowed upon me, the one that I'm most proud of that my mother uses all the time, and she calls me a brat. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, we never grow up in the minds and in the eyes of our parents. We're always their children. So anytime she meets somebody, she'll yeah, my brat. Yeah, he's, he's a good kid, though. He's a good kid. <laughs> yeah, this is probably what you're saying about me. Oh my God. So, all right. So one of the things that really caught my attention about this whole uh, coronavirus pandemic, and, and I wanted to start kind of there, is the importance, you know, it's so important to bond now. We see that we started getting calls, um, you know, for anxiolytics, increased binge eating, increased binge drinking about three months ago when this started. And really people concerned, you know, metabolically unhealthy are not handling COVID as well as people are metabolically healthy. And uh, one of the things I saw you talk about, which, which I find actually very important, is uh, the role of bonding, the role of family, the role of fatherhood. Um, and you framed it in a way, I forget whether it was on social media or where it was, you really highlighted that importance. So I wanted to start there I and mean, maybe talk about you know, the value of having, uh, of, of bonding family, fatherhood, and community now more than ever. Uh, so maybe we can start there. Well, let's see if we can put a couple of things together, because I think that you bring up two really very, very good points, and that is, how do we deal with the problems that we have? And in, in that regard, um, binging on food is a way in which we try to manage some of our frustration and in our, our anxiety. And how does that relate? To this whole idea of uh, of, of bonding, um, one of the things that, of course, we're we're going through uh, right now, or where we have been going through, or at least over the last couple of hundred years, uh, has been this Western civilization culture of moving away from the family and away in and moving into the corporate structure. And the more and more we do that, the more and more we're isolating parents from the children because they have to raise the family. They've got to have adequate income. Half of all of our families across the United States are two wage earners. So it really begs the, the question, um, why are children doing what they're doing? And of course, the answer is it's simply because the parents are, are not around. Bonding is one of the key factors in making sure that our students are emotionally energized as early as possible. The formative years that we have with our children are the best years, the best even months that we can, uh, we can give them. We know, for example, that if moms can have a little extended time beyond what we call just a maternity leave, but beyond that, uh, that there's going to be less depression with these moms. There's going to be less infant mortality if, in fact, we have this higher level of bonding that takes place. The father will... Uh, will have a, a better relationship with that child uh, if, again, bonding does take place. The richness of bonding, I would like to relate to the value of, and, and you know this uh, most, Tro, in, in your educational process in medicine, uh, is the osteopathic medicine approach. And that is, if somebody comes in and they've got a problem, you just don't give them an aspirin. What you really want to find out is what's ticking inside of that person. What is really going on that requires a set of management techniques that will get them through it rather than just superficially just giving them uh, some kind of a pill uh, or, or some kind of dose of something that in the moment is going to make them better, but in the long run, it really won't. And when you look at bonding and you look at parenting and you look at the amount of time that mom, dad, mom, mom, dad, dad, but parents can get together to really facilitate a working relationship with the children, you're going to be able to see things that are going on with the child. You're going to see their anxiety, their frustrations, uh, their, their thirst for something that may be out there. And the bonding 
is going to stimulate conversation. And it's going to be that conversation what is going to get at the host of what's really creating the difficulty in the child. And what you can find in many, many instances is that there's not going to be some kind of superficial decision to get rid of the problem. Could be bullying, could be drugs, could be poor grades, it could be obesity or binging, food binging, that in fact, talking with the child, there could be a great opportunity to get at the essence of the problem and not have something superficial be the way in which to deal with it, but a more systemic, more dramatic, more family-oriented way of trying to give to the child that which the child so richly deserves from their, from their parents. And this also goes to pro this idea of when you're a parent, what is your real responsibility? And I would like to suggest, and as I do suggest and provide uh, in my book, The Fun Book of Fatherhood, and that is that when we talk to our students, uh, or our, our children rather, we talk to them as teachers and as parents. And that not only are we trying to teach the child, but at the same time, we are always being a little available for them to teach us. And again, this teaching component back and forth, that's part of bonding. We just don't have enough time in our society to allow that bonding to take place. And that's why over the last uh, 45 plus years, and I was the first father in this country in the 70s to win a paternity leave, that I've been fighting for not only family leave, but paid family leave. And if we can provide that, I think a host of problems that we see in the young child and in adolescence could potentially um, go away. You know, um, everything you're saying is absolutely so insightful. And I, I want to come back and, and relate it even more pragmatically, you know, to people suffering from anxiety and people suffering from, um, you know, the, and, and look, right now, more than ever, we see there's an anxiety and mental health epidemic in the country, right? We see that, yeah. you know, yep. related to coronavirus, they, these issues just blossom. And I tell people, look, there's a reason why you're going to food. There's a reason why you're going to alcohol. There's a reason why you want anxiolytics. There's a reason why you're an animal that's stressed seeking comfort. It's normal. It's normal. Okay, it's it actually is. normal. And you need to find a way to get that stress release. And I ask, and I often pose this question. I said, if you got together with a bunch of your buddies and, or your family and you were laughing and you were talking and you're crying and having a great time, do you think you'd be sitting there by yourself drinking beer? Do you think that you'd be sitting there, you know, eating something that you're gonna regret? Or do you think that bonding, you know, reaching out for help, talking about your problems, listening to other people and just exchanging and feeling, do you think that will help some of your anxiety in that moment? Do you think that maybe you'd be now producing happy hormones instead of consuming those happy hormones. Um, and so what do you think about that, the, the well, role to, to, of, of that right here and now, you know? To your point, uh, Tro, uh, what's really magnificent about the concept is that if you go to the animal kingdom, you will find that the, soci the, social, the, social, the social ability of the animals allows the animals to be much more adjusted in not only learning what the tribal relationships are, uh, but in addition to that, to make them feel a little bit more comfortable about, about themselves. Today, we don't engage in those kinds of conversations with our children, uh, even at the dining room table. Uh, very often, there is disjointed conversation going on. Rather than trying to focus on learning and understanding how each person is functioning, how each person uh, is doing in their daily life, giving suggestions, promoting well-being, and agree, making sure that the good hormones are flowing through the body, 
uh, rather than negative thoughts, which are not really going to help them, not going to be beneficial to their immune system, and in fact may even drive them into those negative behaviors, such as bullying and uh, obesity and food binging that we uh, that we uh, that we talked about. Uh, it, it's incumbent upon the parent to really make sure that the health and the well-being of their child uh, is foremost their responsibility, and not that they're going to take the role of the physician, but they're certainly going to take the role of trying to do all that they can to give the child every, every ability to feel comfortable about themselves, <clears throat> excuse me, to feel comfortable about what they're doing and to feel comfortable about what their relationship is to everybody else around them in their in their family in their community and even in the bigger world uh, that is uh, that is before them you know one of the things i want to talk about that i think is so important you mentioned you know uh, um the that majority of the uh families in this country uh, that they don't even talk functionally at the dinner table. Maybe it's because of cell phones and social media. Maybe it's because both of them are working. Um, and in fact, I go back to my own childhood and my parents have been, again, some of the best mentors of my life. And to this day, they're mentoring me um, and uh, guiding me. But, you know, they were working two jobs and my diet was relegated to you know, uh, fast food because they couldn't, you know, they couldn't, they didn't have time to really make food. When they did make food, they made food. But during the week, you know, we got fast food, we got pizza, right? And, um, and then when we went to school, you know, because we didn't have time to make the school lunch, we were buying the school lunch. So we were basically eating cheeseburgers and pizza and, and they called in school, they called a cheeseburger a complete meal. <laughs> right, I remember they call yes. the cheeseburger a complete meal, and they still do. Right, the bun, the carbs, the, the protein, ketchup, it's and in, yeah, yeah, it's all. See, they got it all, and they called potato chips a vegetable, That's and French right. fries a vegetable. Okay, so and and so, um, I think there's two things wrong here, and I want to point it out again: the issue of fatherhood and, and family, which is so important, which you've talked about being a pioneer <clears throat> and, and a evangelizer of needing to reform this process to get parents more time with their kids. But then the other part of the problem is, okay, fine. They're in school now, the kids, they're in daycare, they're in, you know, the system. And maybe that system is failing also. Maybe the guidelines that which the schools have to follow, right, the dietary guidelines are not nourishing the kids. Maybe the, um, the guidelines from the USDA you know, or maybe the uh, the recommendations from our medical associations even are not in line with what our population may need. And if you look at the biggest supporters of these medical associations, we're talking about Nestle, PepsiCo, Frito-Lay, Coca-Cola, right? And it could be, so now we have two problems. We have one problem is families don't have time to bond. And then when the kids are left to go uh, into the world, the message is wrong. So how do you how do you feel? I mean, I just want to get your. I know a little, it's a little bit out of the wheelhouse to talk about that, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. No, it, it is very very important because we don't even talk about food when we deliver food at the at the table. You know, it's nothing to pick up a salt shaker and just put some salt on it, and wow, it really tastes good. And if it tastes good, therefore it must be good. And that then just gets buried into the mind of the child. And they have no idea then that the things that they're eating, particularly on the fast food side, may taste very good, but there's no link between the quality of their health. So a number of things have to take place. One, the kitchen table should have that dialogue as to what are the ingredients of everything that we, that we are eating. Uh, and if we could understand it at that level, then we need the translation of that into the fast foods, which no matter how much we want to deny it, we're all participating in that realm of, of eating. But are we able to diminish it as a family and make, the, make our children understand that? And then most importantly, two pieces here. One piece is, are we becoming advocates in the community, whether it be on school boards, community groups, uh, or uh, with our legislators, to try to make changes 
so that there can be a, a difference in the way in which we deliver nutrition to our children and to ourselves. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. We shouldn't have double standards. What we put on, on our table should be on the table of our children, even when they're on the outside, and the children should demand that higher quality. And the second part, and I think uh, you could testify to this even better than I can, Tro, and that is the role of our medical schools and our medical profession in terms of really making people understand the value of nutrition, the influence of food on our health, on our welfare, on our well-being, and what food will do for us in terms of giving us the greatest opportunity for a longer lifespan. Not just to live longer, but simply what we can do with those extra hours, those extra years in our life to be productive and give back to society. So that if we have a change in medical education as we, as we change or, or, or uh, train uh, our physicians, uh, if we have parents who have a greater advocacy prior to, uh, or, or rather uh, a better understanding of foods prior to their advocacy, uh, and then a conversation with our children about what is uh, Hold on one second, Jared. You cut out at advocacy. I don't know if you got a call or something like that. Uh, yeah, think. damn. Unfortunately, there's yeah. a phone built into my iPad here, buddy. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. So let's start back up, Jack. Let's start back up. We're talking about the need for advocacy. All right, so we'll start back here. Uh, do you know what the last item was that I uh, that I said? Yeah, it was about the advocacy. Yeah, it was, uh, uh, the, we're talking about the medical schools uh, have okay, to. Okay, got it. You know, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, here, ad ad advocacy, of course, is really very, very important, it's, and it's the advocacy that happens at the medical school level and making nutrition part of curricula in a very, very big way. Uh, the advocacy of parents participating with community groups, with legislators to make a change, and then the advocacy that goes with uh, modeling, uh, being the role model for the children, so that when they see themselves eat, the children begin to understand, well, th there may be something in that, and that requires a big, big conversation at home. Now, one thing that you may remember in medical school, Tro, uh, and that is something that is done quite extraordinarily well in all medical schools throughout the entire United States. And that is the clubs that are associated with the student government organizations in our medical schools. These are the clubs that really have to be given a great applause because they do go out into the community. They do do health fairs. And our medical students are very concerned about the relationship between medicine, healthcare, and nutrition. And I think our medical school students are doing an awful lot of good in trying to move the bar a little bit toward a better quality of food than away from food. Unfortunately, the language we use with food today, particularly as we see in our commercials, is very deceiving. Uh, if you take uh, caffeine out, if you reduce the amount of sugar, that makes it better when in fact it doesn't necessarily make it better, it adds other chemicals into the compound and therefore it's not really better for the system in terms of how it absorbs all of that. So we need to make a big, big change and business is driving nutrition and physicians unfortunately are not driving uh, uh, nutrition. Uh, the AMA, and uh, the AOA, these are the organizations of osteopathic medicine and allopathic medicine, are doing their best to try to get the message of nutrition out there. But it really is just not enough because they certainly don't have the funding and the marketing capacity that our food industry does have and what they're trying to do for the obvious reason to sell materials. And one of the reasons for this, I think, is, you know, and I may have mentioned it earlier, we are working off an agenda of a Western corporate culture of society rather than working off of a family-centered society. And once we can make that change, and I think paid family leave will move us in that right direction, and I think the pandemic 
has helped us to understand and see the value of that, we may be better off. Yeah, I think it's an important thing because, uh, you know, we, we just say the freshman 15, we just expect that people are going to gain weight. And, you know, I, I, I'm changing my practice. I'm going to be uh, a physician at, on a major campus or here in San Diego, uh, a San Diego Christian campus. And so I'm stepping back and thinking, based on my clinical experience, who do I see doing the worst? Or it's people who are, are addicted to sugar, caffeine, they can't get up, they, you know, they take a study break all the time and they're snacking and they're eating terrible foods. And, you know, the, we have a certain amount of responsibility in that saying, how much is that nutrition to deal with? Because, Tro, you know, as well as I do in med school, I say, okay, everyone, let's take a study break. Okay, let's order a pizza. Let's get some cake. Let's go have some chips or some french fries. It's quick. And, yeah. Yeah. And it's a quick thing. Let's go do it. And then we can relax. And we associate that with relaxing rather than, you know, we're taking a study break. And then, you know, then we want more of that. Our brains just kind of center to that and you know this whole mentality is like we're going to be on call we're going to be up all night we better eat some donuts so we have energy you know that kind of thing happens and i see it in the hospitals all the time yeah i mean l let me let me just say one of the other things here brian that you're saying you're absolutely right you know and and that's one of the things where i have to thank you again dr jerry camarada you asked me to come talk to the students uh in the in the harlem campus and and give them wake them up to the power of nutrition and not a lot of medical schools yet have done that. And so that's one of the things I wanted to just harp on here that um, look, you know, th there are people here. And when I gave that lecture to the medical students there, I got, you know, 50 emails the next day. You know, I got 50 emails the next day. Oh my God, we need to hear this. We need to hear more of this. Can you help me? Can I come do a, a rotation with you? Can I come do an elective with you? And that's how desperate our students are for this knowledge. And you're talking about the AMA and medical schools trying to get this push out about, you know, but if you look at, you know, actually the, a, you know, the, the osteopathic schools are largely uh, uh, separate from this. But if you look at the biggest donors to the allopathic medical schools, they're Nestle, you know, Coca-Cola. Um, these are the biggest donors to academia. Um, and so I, I don't know if we'll ever get the right message out. I don't know if the right message will ever be globally accepted, right? Because well, it stands into stark contrast to the corporate sponsors and the, you know, the Western corporate culture you were talking about. So I, one, I wanted to thank you for letting me reach out to those students. I, I, don't, I don't think there's a more fulfilling thing than being able to shape the, uh, and mentor, you know, 150 students at once on how to approach nutrition so I think that you're right. We need to start there at the medical schools because what are they doing? They're eating pizza and then they're like, why do I feel sleepy? Why do I feel tired? Why, yeah. why am I always hungry? You know, well, let me, so. let me use both of you as, uh, as my priests and I'm in a confessional uh, because yesterday I just had a willy for pasta and I just wanted to have pasta. And last night I, you know, I, I feasted up on pasta and I did not have a very good night last night after, uh, after dinner. Uh, it just lays on your stomach. It has no great value. Um, there's no great nutritional um, worth in all of that. And I paid the price because my mind said to do one thing, but my intelligence was completely ignored, uh, and I didn't do that. Uh, fortunately, it's just a fad. Uh, but, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we all have a tendency to slip back. Clearly, we understand in our society that there are events that take place that allow things from the ground up to swell. And when they swell, millions of people take notice and changes do occur. Uh, clearly with Black Lives Matters, we've seen injustices being take, uh, taking place. Uh, and through that, there now seems to be a revolt, a change, uh, a destiny for wanting to be better relation, better relationships between police departments, social services, and communities. It's needed, it's coming to bear, but it was a ground up. We need something in the area of nutrition that can mobilize our society. And the one thing that we can do is by giving more parents more of an opportunity to be home with their children, to have greater conversation with them, and and you bring up a very good point um, uh, when, when we had the conversation about the kind of people in San Diego um, that we may be dealing with uh, that may be at the lower um, educational level. They're the ones that are the most vulnerable 
And what are we doing to support them in our society so that we can give them the knowledge to be better parents? They are great parents. They love their children. But love and being great and being sincere and feeling comfortable still require knowledge, information. So it's going to be very, very hard to make sure that the educational process that we provide in this country uh, is more equitable. And that with this equality in education, all people get the basic information that they need so that they can be better parents and they can be teachers alongside of the teachers as we give our, uh, our children that information that they need to make better choices. And in our case here in our conversation, better nutritional choices. And I think a big problem, like what you're bringing up, is, is the breakdown of the American family, right? We, you know, a lot of people don't have a mentor or a dad or, or you know, in, I think in our society, we've really underplayed the, the role of the father. You know, I grew up in the married with children where the dad was an idiot and he, he's a buffoon. Um, and, and that trend has continued. If you look at TV, the dad is, is an unnecessary um, uh, part of the family a lot of times it, that's the that's what we're told over and over but yeah. I've seen the impact of having a mentor I've seen lives change from being you know the worst of the worst to, to a great leader in the community and so I, I think we we've lost touch and we we've lost the importance of that bond of of teaching your kids values you know going back I remember when I was a little kid we were at the beach and there was a convertible and there was a nice stereo sitting on the seat of that car and my dad said do you think you can get in there and get that stereo out? and I said yeah he said, you never touch something that's not yours, yeah. right? You, you, know, you never yeah, steal, and, right? And, and th that's a value that I always remember. Yeah, and hundreds of thousands, of, not hundreds of thousands, what am I talking about? A couple of hundred years ago, this was not the case. It was family-oriented. It was almost like Little House on the Prairie. Everybody participated. It was farming. It was agrarian. Uh, you know, people stood together. Uh, moms, dads, children, <clears throat> they all worked the field. They all work together for the common good of keeping themselves informed, uh, uh, making products that then can go to market, but they did it as a family unit. Once the industrialization came about, to its positive, by the way, we really needed that level of mechanization in order to get things done. But the sacrifice was the family was no longer important. The corporation all of a sudden became important and it dictated as to how families would live the rest of their lives and unfortunately our western culture today is so impregnated with this with the drive of technology and business in ruling the way that we operate that it is stagnating the family it is depressing the family and what we're seeing is what we articulated just a little while ago higher incidence of bullying, higher incidence of, of obesity, poor grades in our school. <clears throat> um, divorce rates, right? Divorce rates are, are going up and there's this, there's this demise of the family. And unless we put the family on the pedestal and we make that being the, the paramount of what our society is all about, we're going to have a problem going, going forward. And it's not gonna be easy to deal with and to ameliorate. It's going to continue to get more difficult and more difficult with all of the programs, by the way, we've got out, out there. I've been associated with Peter Yarrow now for a little while. Uh, he's from, if you remember, Peter, Paul and Mary. And Peter has a magnificent program on trying to reduce bullying in, uh, in society by putting programs into schools. And he's in thousands of schools. And yet with all of that, the numbers of uh, bullying that are out there are just simply growing, growing, and growing. Just some thoughts, if we may. We mentioned before, half of all of the families in the United States are two wage earners. They're out. It's not even the old Levitt town where mom stays at home and that we need two salaries in order to pay the bills today, leaving the children more vulnerable. We are only one of two countries in the entire world that does not offer a family leave policy and in very many cases a paid family leave policy and that's terrible 24 percent of the women in this country only 24 percent have stem jobs science technology engineering 
mathematics. That's terrible. That means there's not a role model to give them the encouragement to do what they need to do. Only 1% of Latinos are in computer jobs. That says something about our society. It says something parallel in our society, even to nutrition, because all of these things are falling by the wayside and our society is becoming poorer for it. We're not managing all of these things in the right way. Education, families together, will make a difference, will make things better. Yeah, I can't agree with you more. There's so many disparities, whether you look at uh, uh, sex-based disparities, income, you know, racial disparities. I mean, we see this in medicine uh, all the time. You know, even uh, female doctors are paid about 24% less than male doctors. Um, we see that uh, in, with regards to the other topic you brought up of racial disparities, you know, African-American, Latinos are very frequently experience all medical issues much worse. And these are the people that need our help more than others. And you talked about how are we going to reach those people? And one of the things we're very proud about, and I know Brian feels proud about this, is, you know, we put out education for free. You know, well, this is it. Like you, you have a curriculum, a medical, cur medical nutrition curriculum for free. And we have over 2 million downloads. We're helping two of our colleagues get a Spanish language podcast up to talk about the same issues that we're talking about, nutrition, bonding, mental health, right? All of these things that are very important. Um, and, I, and, and I think this is the physician's role, right? Uh, this is the physician's role. We have to reach people where they are. Um, and so I, I feel very strongly. I know, Brian, you probably feel very strongly about that, reaching people, um, and this is, yeah. this is part of our mission. We can't, we can help maybe a thousand people in our practice, but we've helped over 2 million, 2 million downloads, you know? So the power of information, putting that information in people's hands that yes, we know, uh, you know, that uh, there are guidelines in nutrition, but hey, maybe you want to pay attention to this, you know, instead, because it may drive your health to a better place for you and your family, yeah. you know, imagine being able to every, reach them in that way, you know. Imagine if every uh, every medical school brought in uh, all the restaurant tours uh, in their local fifty mile uh, radius and had a conversation about them, about what their responsibility uh, can be in association with the medical school, and what could we do as a campaign to try to change the way in which we look at food, value food and use food as a way of sustaining ourselves rather than it just being a kind of a pot of, of enjoyment, that there's a sustainability that is really very, very important. Uh, you know, what, can I just tell you, uh, sure, I don't need to interrupt, it's no, exactly, please. you know, uh, this is how good of a mentor you are. The first thing I did when I opened up my practice here in Japan, I reached out to the noodle guy next door. I said, hey, why don't we get some zucchini noodles? I reached out to the pizzeria and said, hey, why don't we get, and what we did, when they actually change their menus to offer zucchini noodles, to offer low carb pizza, to offer, you know, we got a caterer, Nanuet, to do keto meals. There's another uh, Zambetti's and Nanuet that's offering low carb options. So each one of these places we've promoted, we've promoted on our blog, we send out to 3,000, you know, emails to promote them because they are working with us. So we have to work and support them. Yeah. You know, hey, and, and so well, this is what we're doing. So this is why you're a great mentor. You predict the future. It's happening. We're doing it. You may want to send some of some of your listeners to Trader Joe's. They've got great cauliflower gnocchi. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. delicious. I you know, came across I, it and yeah. I love it. Yeah, and I just had a podcast with Tony Hampton, who, who's uh, in the South Side in Chicago. He's African-American. He's doing great things. But the problem is that the grocery stores wouldn't carry cauliflower to make cauliflower rice. They wouldn't have certain vegetables. Like I said, no one buys them and they go bad. And he goes, I'll guarantee you, I'll get people to buy it. Please provide it. And so he educated his community. Now they're making mac and cheese with, with this. And, and so they're, they're learning how to apply it to culturally yeah. what works, right? And, yeah. and we, we just had a, a great Korean American on and he's saying, here's how I talk my family into not eating so much rice. And here's how I talk to the. So when people are saying, look, trust me, I grew up and this is my culture also. And here's what we can do differently. Uh, it has more weight, right, with, with yeah. my Latino friends because I've, I've been overwhelmed going down to Guatemala and seeing the devastation that's happening. These guys say, hey, look, I'm from here. This is what I do. And then people say, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Maybe instead of having five tortillas, I'll just have one or maybe I'll do it this way. 
And so it's great when we, this is what, everything's great in the laboratory when they're locked up in the hospital, but the reality is culturally we go back to our roots. That's what we do for comfort. We go, we go to what we know. And, and, and well, one of the things yeah. that you may want to uh, offer to your, to your listeners is that probably in almost every large city government, there are agencies that can be tapped for resources um, to, to help in one, provide some funding, but two, pro provide some guidance and even mobilization when it comes to nutrition. Uh, certainly we have that in New York City. We, uh, I was the uh, former commissioner under Giuliani and Bloomberg of the Department of Youth and Community Development. Uh, and there we provided lots of funding to organizations that were willing to make a change in their community. You come up with an idea, come up with a valued change, we would try to fund that because ultimately when the community gets better, the entire city got better. And that's the way we looked at New York City. And I bet you Chicago, LA, San Diego, uh, there are lots of these government agencies that can be tapped to assist those that have great ideas and are really trying to make, uh, make a difference. We've tried to go direct to consumer. You know, that's, that's been, you know, I've evangelized. Always the best uh, way, yeah. Yeah, I've evangelized Brian to that path, you know, where, where uh, we've even left the insurance companies out of, out of it because we just want to help people directly for, you know, with the least amount of barriers as possible. Um, and not to say that governments can help. You know, here in New York, man, our, our you know, New York, it's, it can help. You know, the, let me just tell you, the, I'm very jealous of um, my plant-based uh, advocates because they were able to get to mandate that every single hospital in New York uh, has to provide a plant-based option. I'm very jealous of the power of this plant-based movement because they were able to mandate Meatless Mondays. Now I need to think, I think we need to, you know, use the uh, pathways they've put in to get lower carb options available. So maybe make, you know, um, rib ribeye Tuesdays, something in New York City, and maybe makes, you know, these options, these low carb options in every hospital. Because if a diabetic patient goes to a hospital right now, they don't even have a low carb diet. Even though the ADA recommends a low carb diet for, for glycemic food, they don't even recommend it. Uh, they don't even have this option available in most hospitals in New York City. So I think, you know, I'm, uh, you're right. We have to evangelize the, the government, but I think we have to start by evangelizing the people. Yeah, well, grassroots never hurts. Um, and again, it's that same philosophy, uh, whether it be just the family and your grassroots is that you as a parent feel responsible to work with your children every day to be a good role model, to be able to provide stuff on the table and explain why the food is like it is on the table and how, what it took to buy it, maybe even what it took to grow it. And if it's grown one way as opposed to growing another way, is there a difference in the quality of that food? That conversation seeks in. Children are very, very um, wise to conversation and will take the very, very best as to what it is that, they're, what it is that they, they actually need to, uh, they need to know. So go to the consumer, great great idea, the consumer being everybody that's out there. Yeah, I think it's just so important that, uh, you know, we can't wait for the government to tell us what to do. We, we realize there's not a one, we all realize this in practicality, there's not one food plan that works for every single person on earth. And not everyone needs to eat the same thing. So to make a national guideline that says everyone needs to eat this way, it's tough because it's always going to, people are going to say, well, low fat's better, high fat's better, low carbs better, high carbs better, and then they're going to be at war forever. So yeah. I think for us as individuals, we have to be educated and say, what works for me? When do, where, where do I feel well? How do my sugars get under better control? Right. Yeah. And, and so it's a, you know, it, it may be more of a bottom up than a top down approach, but I think we could all agree, you know, in the hospitals, you're giving soda to diabetics and then shooting them with insulin to get rid of the sugar. It's a, it makes zero sense. So, uh, Dr. Kukazella is out doing his stuff and said, guys, what is happening? So he may, he changed the dietary stuff in his hospitals and they're showing benefit from that. They're yeah. not using as much insulin. That all costs money. It's not for free. And I think you part just, of that, yeah. Uh, you know, Brian and Trove, just as both of you are reaching out to your consumers, the people that are on your podcast uh, wanting information about how they can live a better life uh, nutritionally, um, 
you hope that there are people like you that are doing the same thing in other arenas. For example, you remember back to uh, uh, President Clinton uh, when, uh, you know, they made note in his early years that he just enjoyed his cheeseburgers uh, and, uh, and hamburgers. But yet there was nothing systemic that moved from that that a president would say, we're going to hold a national conference on nutrition and we're going to change the value of how nutrition is looked at in the United States of America. But if you can get individuals at that highest level to begin to buy into the value of making a change, that also goes a long way. It helps, it helps you and your podcast and everybody else and what they're doing around the country to to make that difference happen quicker, a lot easier, and more effectively. Uh, so I do think that there is a that there must always be a challenge within us to work very very hard to make relationships with government leaders uh, and to try to get them to want to be a sponsor because they have the ears and the eyes and the mentality of voters out there. And those voters are also consumers of food, uh, and and therefore we should we we really should take it take advantage of that. Yeah, I think one of the problems is is our focus has been so off. Whenever we do government reform to help people, what we do is hey, let's let's cut medicine prices. Well, instead of that, why don't we cut the garbage that's causing us to be on more medicines? And if I if I take my I, I have a patient just recently put him I had to put him on a diabetes medicine six hundred dollars a month, six hundred dollars a month. So to pay me a hundred bucks a month to get you off that dang medicine, you're saving $500 a month for the rest of your life. Plus you're yeah. going to live longer and you're going to be healthier. So it's one of those darn things where you say, you know, we, we, part of it is when the patient feels the pain of having to pay for that medication, they're going to say, I got to make a change. If I'm paying for the medicine or the insurance company's paying, they don't care as much. Right. Yeah. So it's one of those things. There's no skin in the game and there's no, there's no consequence at some point, you know, I mean, everyone else's prices go up because we have to pay for that medication that we have to cover. No, it's not free. When it comes to the, the, you know, the pharmaceuticals um, and other kinds of uh, organizations, there's no money in wellness. The money is in uh, research. The money is in drugs that allow you to treat problems as long as the problems could, re, could remain. Um, and that's a very sad commentary that I should even have to make. It is a reality that we know is out there. Um, but until that old Chinese... Uh, doctrine uh, that you pay the doctor only when you're well and when you're sick you no longer and this goes back you know maybe uh, 5,000 years ago uh, and as long as you've got a society that values their own wellness that they members of that society don't want to be sick that they're going to work hard to stay well and therefore the doctor benefits from that because the doctor is part of the equation until we can get that inculcated uh, going to be very, very difficult to break this chain. But every day, no matter how difficult, the, how difficult it is, every day our job is to work toward breaking that chain. And we do it in small increments. And ultimately, if we reach as, you know, the old, uh, the old saying goes, you reach one person, make one change, you've done a lifetime worth of work. There's a lot of truth in that. You save one child in your family uh, from the darkness of life and you give them the opportunity to be maximally successful, you've done a yeoman's job. So your podcast fits right into that. And the harder you work every day in reaching more and more viewers and get them to understand the value of what they're doing, the better our society is absolutely going to be. Yeah. And we realize that it can't be about us. So, you know, the more docs we bring into the fold, how many, how many lives, how many people will they touch through their lifetime? You get one hairdresser or nail tech or whatever that, that can really reach their community, a community leader, you know, someone out there who, who people respect that they care about, they can really impact. And you see, I've seen, I've seen things that I would consider a miracle where one person steps up and says, that's it. We're going to fight this crime that we have in our city. We're going to clean up this stuff and we're going to make it nice. And then all of a sudden these other people jump in and they do amazing things. You know, there's people they call a posse here in, in, in San Diego and there are a bunch of contract workers, the contractors and, and window, and they go to the poor areas and say, okay, we're going to attack this house and we're going to fix the windows. We're going to put in plumbing. We're going to fix all these problems for this person. And, and they do it. And that's their, that's their goal in life to leave it better than where they came. And I think what we're seeing now is people go in and destroy other people's stuff. And, and it's yeah. a hard, 
you know, it's that, that mindset of, you know, I'm going to take from you um, rather than I want to leave it better than when I got here. You know, when you go to a beautiful park and then you see people just throw garbage everywhere and you think, wow, don't they like think about walking the garbage can that's sitting there. Right. You know, and, and so you, you, you start realizing that, that I don't know if we just become really lazy or just don't care or we're just apathetic or if it's that, that community, that sense of community or say, I want, I want to improve my community. I want to, to I want to leave my fingerprints all over this thing. Well, I think it's apathy. I think it's really, there's been a lot of apathy. You know, if you look at diets, it's diet apathy is a big deal. If you look at moral morality, moral relativism is huge right now. Um, so I think it's, I think you're, it's not lazy. Look at people, people are marching, people are wearing masks. Nobody's lazy, right? They will do it, but I think it's apathy. They just think that it's just them alone in the yeah. sea, right? It's interesting when I, when I was down in San Diego, Brian, uh, maybe about two years ago at a conference, uh, just to see the, the, the beautiful environment down, downtown, the, the restaurants uh, were just uh, overwhelmed with individuals. Everybody was having, having a good time. And two things were rather shocking to me. One, I took the train and went to Tijuana because you have to go to Tijuana. I've never been there before. And the level of poverty. The, 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 the level of uh, not appreciating and uh, not, I shouldn't say appreciate, that, that, that really is, that's not a good statement. Uh, not understanding the things uh, that they needed to have, and some of them were just happy the way they were, but it was sad that just miles away, there was a different kind of life. And I don't care if it's a different country, that doesn't matter. People are people, and when you've got towns so close to each other, they should share the same kind of value that every human being deserves to have. But in addition to that, you now have scooters uh, in your town as they are uh, popping up in, in other towns. And I just could not believe smart young people, women, riding the scooters with high heels. And these are electric scooters. And if they stopped short, they couldn't possibly save themselves. So again, very often, we don't use our intelligence. We just use what our emotional experience wants us to uh, have a high on. And that's hurting us. It's hurting us with nutrition. It's hurting us in other areas, other areas of life. We need to be tr begin to train our young people more and more at risk factors, at what's important for them, and how they can enjoy life even at the same time by doing the things that will benefit them. Uh, and again, food is gonna be one of those things that we need to concentrate on. Yeah, and I think I think caring about each other, from your perspective, I'm a young dad, I'm not a young dad, but if I am a young dad, what advice would you give that gentleman about well, I, instilling values in kids or what they can do to really make their kids a good member of society? I think one is to remind every young person, and uh, a lot of young people uh, have uh, graduated high school, have graduated college, for them to understand that their primary responsibility by getting that degree is to function for the rest of their life as a teacher and to make sure that the child that they're bringing up understands everything that is being offered to them. Secondly, not always make choices for the children. Very important that you allow the student, the, the, the children, to make the choices for themselves, being a guide to them in getting them to make choices. The more choices we make for young people, the more they don't understand those choices. They just do as they're told and therefore have no appreciation as to the value of what uh, is taking place. Secondly, the more we do for a child, the more there's just kind of a uh, laissez-faire attitude about it. Well, it's just going to happen. It's no big deal. Uh, but if we work with our children and we give them every opportunity to think about what they're doing, to make some choices about what they're doing, even if some of those choices are not always absolutely correct, but they made a choice and the parents worked with them in either following it through or making corrections, then the role of the parent is gonna be that much better. It's going to give the skills that the child needs early on um, a value 
that will make their life a little bit more comfortable as they uh, as they live it. Uh, but today we're we're allowing our children to make decisions themselves without any parental input, and that lack of parental input, uh, not saying this is what you must do, but rather input in the conversation about it, that's leaving them just very, very vulnerable for other people to have a negative influence on them. And that negative influence is bringing up all the problems that we discussed uh, early, early on. In the animal community, by the way, <laughs> which I talk about rather extensively in my book, The Fun Book of Fatherhood, uh, the animal community, you see animal adults working with the youngsters, letting them uh, you know, particularly in the uh, uh, in the monkey species and the orangutan species, uh, they will let them, you know, fall a little bit. They'll let them have a little bit of a fight. They'll let them see the trials and the tribulations, and then they'll give them leadership in terms of role modeling as to what their behaviors need to be. It's a learning process, but learning requires mentoring, and mentoring is a significant value in who we are as parents. You know, I can't, I can't agree as much that, that uh, being available, you know, people ask me, you know, I have nothing against the psychotherapy and coaching and psychiatric professions. I've never been to a psychiatrist. Um, people ask me, well, what, you should go to one. And I, I think that maybe that's a great idea. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I should. Actually, in fact, Brian's been encouraging me no to go comment. to a psychiatrist for years. <laughs> but uh, people ask me, well, you know, why, why, you know, they're so valuable to them. And I said, like, my grandma, my cousins, my brother, my sister, <laughs> you know, my, I don't have a sister, but my, my mom, my dad, I talk to them about my problems, my uncles, my cousins. Yeah. I talk to them about what's going on in my life. I bond with them. They bond with me. They give me their insight. You know, they tell me, uh, they give me advice, you know, I'll tell you oh, how can you listen? So I don't know. Like, it's not that I don't think Maybe the need for that has increased because we've lost that bond. I think know? we've lost that bond. I think, you know, one of, I re, I'll never forget. As a matter of fact, it's our editor's dad. We were sitting there one day and, I, and he said, how's the family? Everything's great. And he's one of the greatest guys on earth. Great father. And, and I said, well, I'm kind of nervous. My kids are going into teenage years and you know how that is. And, you know, he said, what do you mean? I said, you know, disrespect and those kind of things. And now my kids, you know, 21 and, and 19. And he said, don't buy into that. He said, you love your kids, you're there for them and you support them and you're consistent and, and you, you, you're, you're um, reasonable and you help them. And he said, you'll never have a problem. And I've never had a problem. You know, it was one of those great advice because I think so many people say, yeah, it's normal for a kid to ignore you and to talk back and talk bad about mom and all these things. And I've never experienced that. You know, I really never have. And people say, you're so lucky. And I, I said, you know, I don't think it's luck. I think it's where you focus your energy. And and that's a big part of me making a career choice. I said, I want to be home and have dinner with my family. How many dinners have I missed sitting down just talking about life or just just spending that time? And, and my kids always knew when I came home, I'm there with them. I put everything else away and they're my focus. But how many times do we say, yeah, they'll understand next week we'll get, we'll go out and we'll talk and we'll, we'll go for a walk. And, and uh, you know, it's crazy the influence. And I've really, uh, you know, it's funny because my wife will tell me, you know, like just you know, I have two daughters and if I go out with one of them and say, Hey, let's just hang out, me and you go to dinner, not the family, just me and you. And they get dressed up, they put their makeup on. It's a huge deal. Right? You don't realize yeah. the, the, the impact of that. And, and also being a role model where they say, look, I'm not settling for someone who doesn't treat me with respect and kindness. And, and is a decent person, it's not about what kind of car you're driving. I think so many of us have been so caught up in that as a society where we think if we have the nicest car in the neighborhood, everyone's going to like us more and we're going to be a better person, even though we sacrifice our family and you what's know, really important. A lot, of, a lot of this conversation could be couched in something that's a little different, but I think has a lot of relevancy. And that's the ability of a parent to say, I'm sorry, that was a mistake. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, because inherent in this conversation is the vulnerability that a parent can show a child. And in that vulnerability, make the child realize that we're all apt to make a mistake. We're all apt to have feelings about what we've, what we've done. We do have the ability to, um, uh, to correct ourselves. And in the process, the children begin to see that they've got that same responsibility to themselves to get that, uh, to get that, uh, that done. Uh, yeah. I think I'm, I've lost a signal here. Are we still on? Yeah, yeah, we're here. Yeah, we're still here. We're here. All right, this is, this, this is good.
Yeah, and um, I think so, that's an important point. Take responsibility. Take responsibility. Don't make excuses. Don't say someone else made me do it, and that's why. So yeah, I blew it. <laughs> I think that's so easy. I think right, when, you know, if you would address things, they go, I was wrong. I blew it. That, that's why yeah. in medicine, there's doctors who cannot admit that what we're doing works. They just can't bring the because for years they said something. And I'm okay saying, yeah, you know, I used to say two years ago, I was wrong. Here's how it is. Here's what I'm, there's what's working, right? Yeah. So I think at some point, you know, Professor Tim Noakes reversed himself. All of these people, I can, people I respect them. As a matter of fact, just recently, there was a vegan bodybuilder who came out and said, I was having too many health problems. And he was just honest. And he got hate mail and death threats and all this kind of stuff because he was being honest. He's not going to be a hypocrite. He could have went his whole life and told everyone, yeah, I'm, this is what I'm doing. I'm, but he said, look, for my family, I got to do what's right. And, and this is the right thing. And I respect that, right? Well, even if I don't agree with your, what you're doing, I respect someone who's just honest and said, look, what I was doing wasn't working. So I changed tax and I feel better. You know, I think if, if more parents um, took their children to a zoo and just didn't look at the animals uh, haphazardly, but looked at what the animals were doing, how they related to each other, how they groomed each other, how they ate you'd find so many incredible experiences that would help in the children understanding the role that they play in the family in the way things take place. Uh, and through that example, uh, you'll find that there is no need for the parent to dictate, but rather they begin to make their own choices. Uh, for example, a raccoon eating, it's a very sloppy eater. You know, everything is in the face. And if you said to the child, do you like the way that raccoon is eating? They'll tell you, oh, no, daddy. Oh, my heavens, it's very sloppy. But then if you told the child, you know, you're eating, eating in a very sloppy way, please be a little neater. They'll just reject it and they'll do, they'll do it a different way. But they made the choice, but you were the catalyst for that choice to take place. Uh, so, you know, sometimes using examples is a very good way of, uh, of doing that. But again, as I said before, humility. I think is a very, very important, uh, plays a very, very important role. And no longer being in a Victorian society where, well, I don't talk to my children about that. We're at a day and age where we do talk to the children about that. We talk to them about what is in their best interest, what is healthy, what they believe to be valued to them before we begin to tell them what we believe is the value that we, we think is important for them to continue or, or, or to, to engage. Uh, and, you know, the, there are no holds barred today. Children ask us questions at very, very early ages. We've got to be willing to answer them, answer them uh, faithfully, uh, answer them accurately, and to seek answers elsewhere. Uh, you know, I guess that goes to what you said uh, earlier, Tro, about a psychiatrist. You know, how, oh, don't go to a psychiatrist. What, are you crazy? You're not going to do that. You must be abnormal that you have to go to a psychiatrist. What's wrong with you? And there's nothing wrong with you. It really is saying in our society, well, if you can't do this as a family, if you can't have this conversation of life throughout all of your years, then what you haven't received, you may need to go to a professional who can perhaps put this back into focus to make you a better person. And that's fine. And I just want to get, like, yeah. I, I have a, we, we, we have coaches here that help people. We have, uh, and there's nothing wrong. And I've needed coaching myself. I've needed professional help in so many different ways. And I, I don't mean to be uh, judgmental when I say that. It's just, you know, for me, for me personally, I'm able to get uh, some relief from my own mental anxieties and my own, uh, mental, you know, depressive thoughts by talking to my family. And if I needed help, I certainly would seek it out with no shame or guilt whatsoever. Um, so I, I just want to yeah, clarify and, that. and I think that's, that's important too. And in, in my life, I've had um, friends who've been uh, mentors and have been, they called me out, go, Brian, you didn't handle that very well. Here's what you should have said. Here's, here's something maybe next time, you right? And I have a wife who will look at me, like shake her head a little bit. I know she's like, don't go there with the, you know, you're going to get in trouble with this one with our oldest or youngest daughter, right? So having that wisdom, some us guys, a lot of times we just want to fix the problem and not say that, you know, you have tacked at it. We go, okay, we're a doctor, fix it. Here, just do this and this and you'll be fine, right? Instead of saying, okay, I, let me just listen to you and, and, and why it's frustrating to you. And, and, you know, one other thing I, culturally that, that I wanted to raise, like when you talked about going down to Mexico, I've spent a lot of time in, in Latin America doing volunteer work. And 
I was in Guatemala and I'll never forget it. Like we were at this table with homeless kids. We, we were serving them and we would serve it. And the, the, the bigger kids were at the end of the table next to me and they would all get their plate full of food. And you know, they're hungry because they haven't eaten. I get emotional when you're thinking about it, but all of them passed the food right down to the little kids to make sure they were fed first. Like they were yep. thinking about other people before themselves. I'm like in the U S they would have grabbed it and ate it. They have no perspective on that. And, and so to see those kind of things where the older kids were showing the younger kids how to tie their shoes, how to do stuff, just loving them. That's just what we had. To, they had to get that from their parents though. That, that is a learned behavior. And clearly it's not something that you're born with. That is learned from parents. Great. Yeah, and these, these kids were homeless. I mean, they, a lot of them didn't have parents, but they, the older ones mentored the younger, but they got it from somewhere. They had a role model. They had someone who taught them, say, hey, you make sure they're taken care of first and then you get yours. And so no one would eat until all the kids had their food. And I was like, wow, because you know, they, they've been without and they know. In the yeah. U.S., a lot of us have never been without, so we have no idea. So we get into fights if, if we have to wait for five minutes to get your you know, food at the, at the restaurant or whatever it is. And over there, they're very appreciative and thankful. And, and so I think for me, both of my kids went with me on medical trips down to Central America and they were all, they were both changed. They came back and they saw the world differently and they're like, wow, I appreciate it. That's, that's absolutely great. Could we cut it right there for a moment? Absolutely. Possible to do, okay, just one second. One of my... Well, you know, uh, we're on? Yep, we're good to go. Okay. Uh, Jack's going to earn his money today. Yeah. <laughs> just my ability to... Uh, to do a promo because Father's Day is coming up in just uh, just a couple of days, um, and this is to renew our uh, our confidence and our value and, and who we are as dads uh, as we did last month with moms. Uh, but I really do encourage your your listeners if they want to understand what the role of parenting is all about, what the role of dads, moms are all about. And how the use of the animal kingdom can be so incredibly successful in driving the message home on so many aspects of life. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, to look at. Now, let's see if we can put this into the focus. Well, maybe we maybe we can. Um, well, we're just audio anyway, so that's good. But no, we will just, put just a link. Right. Yeah, yeah, we'll put, put a link to your book. Put the link up. That would that would be uh, that For would sure. be terrific. Uh, and uh, they will really have a wealth of information. Uh, including nutrition in there as uh, as well as the animals understand nutrition and how we as humans should understand nutrition to be uh, to be better parents. Yeah, it's an amazing book. I've read it and uh, I luckily I have a signed copy uh, <laughs> and I'm really, really happy to support you. You've always been very supportive of me. It's a great book. I think now more than ever, we need the family, the bonding. Uh, we need to understand this. Um, and as it relates, because if you don't get that relief from the family and the bonding, you're going to seek it out elsewhere. So I, I thank you so much, uh, Dean Jerry Camerata, Dr. Jerry Camerata, for coming here. Uh, it's always my always pleasure. pleasure. I yeah. wish all of you the very, very best, and uh, let us never give up on the messages that we hold so dear to us, uh, and that uh, as parenting is important to us, nutrition uh, has a level of importance that may be, it may even surpass that, and it probably does surpass that, because nutrition is really what life is all about. And if we start there and we build a foundation from that, uh, I think we're going to have a better society. Our children are going to be far better for it. We're going to live longer. And for every year extra we live, think about how many great things we're going to be able to do for ourselves, our family, and our society. Yeah, that, that is so, so true. And, and, you know, just in closing, it, just to hammer this point home, uh, you know, with Tony Hampton, we just had this interview and he's in Chicago and he says there's two towns that are right next to each other. One's in the affluent area, the, the other's in the poor area. The difference in, of lifespan, one area is 90 years of age, expected life expectancy. The other town, 60. That's yeah. 30 years, 30 years of lost mentors, of lost times with your grandkids and your, your great grandkids and all that stuff, 30 years yep. based on your zip code. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. tough. That's, so that's, why, that's why we all have to do our job and, and be mentors and go out and help the hurting and help people and love our neighbors and all that kind of stuff we talk about because it's so critical. And you know, raising kids to do the same thing and, and neighbor kids or whoever it is, whoever we can have that influence on. So many people listening are doing great stuff in the, in the community and we're, we're so happy to support that, whatever we can do. So, agreed, 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 yeah, agreed. Absolutely. 
And thank you for your wisdom and for joining us. And, and this is really thank important. You guys. You've been really great. Important. Good luck to you in all that you do. And good luck to all of your listeners as well. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Absolutely. We can stop. <laughs>